Christ. Hey, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church. I'm Cody, I'm a staff member here, I'm a pastor, and before anything else, we need you to know that we're a no matter church. And really what that means is no matter uh, where you're joining us from today, no matter what you're bringing, uh, if you're anxious, you're stressed, um, what, whatever spot you're in right now, we're really glad you're here. And we need you to know that you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to clean yourself up to be here. Uh, but Prairie Lakes Church is a safe place for you to look for God, to find community, um, so we're really glad they're here and and if you're brand new or or maybe you've been here for a while and you haven't become known you've just kind of been stuck attending anonymously at home um, and you haven't taken next steps uh, I'd encourage you to take that next level uh, that next step of deeper engagement here by becoming known and taking a next step uh, because we know that we're not made to do this life alone I know when I find myself isolated and doing things on my own I can just feel that in my soul uh, and I, I don't want that for you. I want you to be connected. I want you to be growing in your relationship with others and with God. And if you take that step here today, I'll send you an Amazon gift card as a thank you. And all you need to do is text the word NEW to the number 99581. And if you're an insider with us today, um, the next step that all followers of Jesus are called to take is giving. 
generously. It is a step of obedience and it is also an act of worship. So if you want to join me in giving, maybe it's for the first time, maybe you know you need to act on the nudge that you've had um, and take that step of obedience to give um, online. You can do that right now. You can join me in giving by going to prairielakes.org forward slash give. But we are going to continue in our Anchor series here today, so let's kick to Pastor John. Hey, great job getting yourself uh, up this weekend and being here. We are really grateful for that. Really good job. You're starting your week off the right way, and I'm proud of you, so, so excellent job. And don't ever forget this at Prairie Lakes. We're a no matter church. No matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done, or even what's been done to you, God does love you. You can't change that. He loves you. You can go on the journey here. You don't got to be perfect. You don't have it all figured out. We're really glad that you're here. All right, so here's the deal. Um, I have been a pastor um, and the lead pastor for 25 years. I'm in my 26th year at Prairie Lakes right now. And for 26 years, I've done some stuff from the stage, okay? 26 years. Um, I've done lots of things. I've had cars on the stage. I've had a boat on the stage, uh, chains, fences, bridges, padlocks, rocks, treadmills, ladders, dogs, even snakes, but never have I gone pantless on the stage. Never. So because Jesse did it, I'm just going to go shirtless this week, okay? So we're, we're going to have to just, no, I'm not going to do that. That's the last thing that you want to see. But here's the deal. Summer is awesome. And, and summer just takes on a on a different vibe in Iowa, right? So, so we're, we're, we're long winter keeps us uh, cooped up inside. And we, when we can actually go outside and enjoy it without forming frost sickles on our eyelashes, it's a beautiful thing. It, it, it's, it's, it's great. We go all in and sometimes in Iowa, we summer so hard that we get to the end of it and find that we've drifted away from God and found ourselves in a spot we didn't plan on being. And here's what the data says, and here's what we all know intuitively. It's not just the summer where drift is likely. <laughs> drift is a problem in every season and every stage of our lives. In fact, we drift. It starts out with a little Sunday sleep in, a step of disconnecting, a little habit, a touch of bitterness, a lack of faith, and then before we know it, Jesus becomes a tiny dot on the shoreline of our lives. Drifting can happen in any marriage. If I don't nurture, learn, and pray and honor my spouse, I can drift. Drifting can happen with my, with, with my kids if I agree to an unhealthy work schedule or don't develop good family rhythms. Drifting can happen in my finances if I slowly turn to credit cards in the last days of every month. Drifting is an easy summer breeze that pushes us away from what's most important. Drifting is something we are naturally gifted at. Because think about it, it takes no effort. It's just natural to us. And here's the deal. <laughs> when it comes to boats and drifting, the anchor keeps us from drifting. An anchor holds us in place and prevents drift <laughs> when you're fishing or swimming or, or doing your thing. That's what the anchor does. And so in this series, we've said, hey, let's spend a few weeks together and let's set some anchors down that will keep us from drifting. <laughs> Last week uh, was you and God, and this week we're going to go you and God's family as an anchor that we need to set. Last week, Jesse taught, let's just call it very uniquely. It was great, by the way. And he modeled to us what it's like to have a, regular, a rather uh, anchor set of Bible reading, 
and prayer, a daily anchor of Bible reading and prayer that keeps us from drifting away from God. So this week, let's set another anchor to prevent drift from God this summer and in all of the seasons. <laughs> and anchors of, of you and God's family. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with this. If Jesse set a daily anchor of Bible study and prayer, let's set a Sunday anchor of church together. Let, let, let's set the Sunday anchor. I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, I can worship God in my PJs. Yep, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I can worship God on the boat or at the river or, or at the lake or sitting in my backyard. Yes, yes, and yes. But there's something unique about this thing called the gathered church where we, where we show up <laughs> clean and unclean healed and broken, lost and found, still drifting and done drifting, that God asks us to do. It wasn't invented by some monk in the 13th century. It was not. This is something that God says, we, we, I want you to do this. And we do this because God said to do it, and with good reason. In fact, it starts way back in the Old Testament. Think of the, the Big Ten, right? The Ten Commandments. And, and the Ten Commandments were, were God's, God, God's um, commandments to the nation of Israel to say, here's how you live at peace with God and with community. And if you just follow these Ten Commandments, you'll be at peace with God and, and peace with others. And, and the fourth one, uh, he, he said this. He said, remember the Sabbath day. To, to keep it holy and establish this pattern that said, let's, let's have this one day, let's have this one day where, where it's different than the rest. And, and it's based on the creation account. So, so God gave those to Moses, Moses presented them to God, but, but way before that in the creation account, here was the establishment of this day that was set aside that was supposed to be different. And in Genesis 2, 2 and 3, it says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. See what he said? God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. <laughs> There's so much noise, by the way, around Sabbath and, and the church day, what church and what, what can I do and what can they do and what should I do and what shouldn't I do. And I want to just remind you that, that a couple of years ago, we did an entire series on this, Rhythms of Rest, and, and we have a bunch of links up that if you are curious and you want to get better at this thing called Sabbath and better at this thing about taking this day, just our usual 99581 number, text Sabbath, and you'll get, you'll get a link to all kinds of resources that can help with, with that. And I know there's just there's noise around it, but, but, but here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want, I want us to know. That when Jesus started to walk the earth 2,000 years ago, and he spent 30 of his 33 years just being a, 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 whatever, a normal human being. He was fully God, yet he was fully man. He was sent from heaven for the assignment of the seek and save the lost. But, but when Jesus came, here's what he did. He not only talked about this thing called the Sabbath, but he modeled it. In fact, we see it over and over, and there's multiple references. There's three just, just simple examples of, this is Jesus. So it's Jesus, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, and look what it says, as was his, what's it say? Custom, right? That, this is Jesus. This is what, this is what he did, okay? That's, uh, and here's one from uh, Mark, Mark 121. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Here's another one from later in Luke. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And there's, there's 12 more of those. And here's what we know. Here's what we know. That Jesus not only taught it and fulfilled all the law, but he modeled it as a fully God, yet fully human people who walked on the earth. Acts through Revelation, right? The rest of the New Testament is filled with moment after moment where the church gathered for worship and Bible and encouragement and fellowship. God is saying, I made you and I know you and I know what you need. And what you need is this day. It's this day. Now let's just, let's just kind of slow it. Let's reduce this thing down, down to this because this is, this is so crucial. 
God said, this, God said to set aside a day for him where you stop earning and stop producing and stop feeling like you have to prove yourself or earn your keep. Now, let's just sit on that, that concept just for a moment. Stop producing, stop earning, stop feeling like you need to pr- pr- earn your keep, right? And, and just, just think of that. For, for, for six days a week, we, we're, we're kind of on, right? We got to do this and we got to do that. And we're concerned about what people think and we're concerned about what's going on. And we're consumed, right? We're consumed with this thing called life. And God says, I, I want you to just take the one day and simply acknowledge me and my sovereign power. Jesus kept it going and the entire New Testament reflects the practice. It's not about you, it's not about me. It's not about the pastor or the passage or the delivery method. It's about stopping everything else and, in, and, and joining together with a bunch of other people on the same journey, learning together, praying together, reading together, singing praise together, on mission together, giving him room and getting pointed back to him. And just think about that. If you can set, if you can set down this anchor, the Sunday anchor, And you can set that down in your life, in the life of your family. And that can keep you from from drifting. That holds you on that pattern of, of I'm going to join together with God's family. There's going to be some amazing things that God's going to do. He's going to bless your obedience in what he established in creation, what he carried throughout with his community of Israel in the Old Testament, what Jesus modeled in all the New Testament is based on is this thing called this family that gathers together. It is. I want everybody in your Bible now to grab it and go to Mark chapter 2, okay? Go to Mark chapter 2. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John are the four Gospels, so they're pretty easy to find. If you didn't use your table of contents, just use your table of contents. Listen, um, so many of us are learning, and we're always learning, but so many of us are, are new to this thing called the Bible, so don't be intimidated by it. Just dig in and, and, and start to get after it, start to read, start to do your thing with it, okay? So, so there's, this, there's this part where Jesus just kind of speaks to this, and he, and he frees it from all of the junk, right? This, this gathering thing and this, this Sabbath thing. So it says in Mark 2, verse 23, it says, One Sabbath, so right on the Saturday for them, Sunday for us, okay, whatever. Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his, as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain, right? No big deal, right? For us, what, what is the big deal? But, right, they turned this, this, this church thing into this crazy do's and don'ts of what they should and shouldn't do. And the Pharisees, who were, the, who were the kind of the legalistic people, said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And then Jesus answered, he says, have you never read what David, talk about King David, did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is, a, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he gave, also gave some to his companions. And then Jesus said to them, and this is crucial now, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, Jesus, is Lord even of the Sabbath. So, so look what it says. This thing called this, this, this gift that he's given us, this one day, this thing called gather together and, 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 and get pointed towards me, right? And come back to me and, and get, get back to due north, right? This one day, Jesus says, listen, this is for you. The Sabbath was made for you. The Sabbath was made for me. This is a gift that God has given us. And he's dropped it in our last and said, I want you to do this. And when we deny this gift, think about this. When we deny this gift and we we kind of say, well, you know what? I've kind of got to do life on my own terms and I'm going to to kind of go the way I want to go. And when you lose that Sunday anchor of, of gathering together, when you lose that and that you start to drift, here's what happens. You're denying yourself what God has set in place for the good of your soul. He made you. He created you. He knows you. He knows what's best. Embedded in all of creation, here's what he did. He said, I want this one day where you just quit, just stop. Focus on me. Focus together on on me. Get pointed back to me. Give me room 
in your life. Give me room in your life. Here's the deal. You know this and I know this. The world, the flesh, and the devil. So, right, we did a whole series on that a lot long ago. The world is kind of the system around us, right? And the system is corrupted. It just is, right? Not, not, not the government. We all know that, right? But, but like the system of like, like the need for selfishness and revenge and vengeance and one-upmanship and, and I got to get mine, and right? It's just, it's a world that just always kind of, kind of tugs at us. So, so if, if, if God's, you know, d- do north here, right? If God's do north, then, then here's, what, here's what the world does. The world kind of says, ah, do your own thing. Ah, you know what? That's not right. They're not treating you right now. Oh, you know, you're kind of getting cheated over, and, right? And the world just kind of keeps twisting you. And then we have this thing called the flesh, right? Which is our bodies, and our, and our flesh is always pulling, oh, don't you want that? Mm-hmm. In fact, you deserve more of that. Oh, yeah. And it's just getting pulled, right? We just keep getting, we just keep getting twisted, and the drift just starts to happen. And then we have this, this real live being called the devil who is actively seeking to destroy. He tried to destroy Jesus, his ministry. He tries to do the same thing to you and to me. And you know what? The world, the flesh, and the devil, for six days and nights, for 144 hours, for 8,640 minutes, or 518,400 seconds, the world, the flesh, and the devil are giving us every opportunity to drift. Everyone. And that's why God says, set the anchor down. Set it down. Don't drift. This is my gift to you for you. You gather together with the rest of these no matter yahoos and we get pointed back to him, anchored one day a week. That's what we do. And I'm asking you, not just this summer, but throughout the seasons and stages of your life is to set this Sunday anchor in place so you don't drift. You don't drift. I'm, I'm a, as you know, I'm a pastor, right? So basically for the last 34 years, um, I haven't had the option of drifting away on weekends, right? And all of a sudden, in two months, I haven't been to church or something like that. But just recently, I was, for the first time in all of my adult professional life, I had the opportunity to drift. So it was last October when we, we, uh, Jesse took over the reins as a lead pastor and I switched seats to be the te- founding and teaching pastor. Um, there was October, November, December. And, and for October, kind of the plan was for me to just kind of watch from home and, and be home and breathe. And, 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 and I can tell you, here's my experience. Okay, here was my experience over just a few weeks of not having that Sunday anchor set. I, I learned this. I, I began to miss so much of what God was, was up to. I, I began to just kind of live my days and, and live the weeks, and pretty soon there was another week, and pretty soon there was another week. And one day I stopped and I realized, you know what? I haven't given God a lot of extra thought. I, I noticed that I quit noticing what he was up to. And you see, when you, when you drift like that picture had and Pretty soon you just didn't mean to, but you just do. And Jesus is kind of way over there, and somehow you got over here. I began to notice that I quit noticing what God was up to and being grateful and missing these little moments like sunsets and sunrises and calm in the middle of a hectic day. Set the Sunday anchor of church together. It's a powerful weapon against spiritual drift, not just this summer, but for every season. Now let's let's set this Sunday anchor even deeper, okay? Let's let's just take it just another let's take it just another step, all right? So yes, let's set the Sunday anchor, but to take it deeper, let's do this. Let's add church friendships, okay? Around Jesus. Let's Let's add church friendships around Jesus as Iowans, right? And some of us have a, have a tough time with this one, right? We've got lots of acquaintances. I know lots of people. I say hi. I drive. I know everybody in the road because I say hi to them all the time, okay? Lots of acquaintances. Lots of people around me. 
But you know, it goes against some of our Iowa values. These have these kind of vulnerable, deep friendships where you let people in, where, where we kind of put away our self-sufficiency and be willing to ask for help, where we have to kind of maybe put away some, some privacy and allow some people to, to see us for kind of who we really are. And then here's what happens, right? Here's Jesus. Jesus always throws a wrench into our personal value system. Here's Jesus. He models the exact opposite of what you and I usually do, which is avoid friendship, which is avoid entanglement, which is avoid people around me that I might need to help or they might need to help me. And if anyone could have done it alone, it was him. But Jesus, he chose friendships. He chose them. Now, here's a Here's a list, just in case, it's always, a good, it's always a good little quiz, name the 12 apostles, okay? But here they are in Matthew 10, 2 to 4, here they are, and here's what it simply says. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, with a little, a little note, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Debedee, Zebedee, Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. See, this weren't just some guys that were like, we've got some board seats to fill, or Jesus wanted some placeholders just to kind of make sure, you know, people felt like they could be useful. He didn't do that at all. These were his friends and his disciples. They lived life together. They served together. They prayed together. They fought together. They weathered hard times together. They had friendship. They did. He was the center, the glue, and the most important. But they were friends. He let them in. He chose that. Well, everybody in your Bible, you're, you're in Mark. Go to, go to Mark 14, okay? Just go back a little bit, okay? And we get to Mark 14, and we have this. This is, the, this is one of those spots that I, I read it, and I, 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 I almost get uncomfortable. I, I right? Because it, it, it's this picture of this, this kind of full humanity of Jesus, fully God, yet he was fully human. And what he portrays, starting in verse 32, tells you the level of friendship that he felt with, with these, these guys. So it says in 32, it says, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Right, so he brought them all, all 12 of them. You guys sit here. And then he took Peter, James, and John, who were kind of the three leaders of the group, along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. And, and look at this. This is Jesus. This is Jesus saying this. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch with me. That's, here's this Jesus who not only set down the Sabbath or the Sunday anchor, right, of, of worshiping together, but he added to it with deep friendships around himself. He, he added to it. Uh, and, 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 and that's what he did, the anchor of friendships that were around him. He, this is what Jesus was about. The one common drifting theme that I see in my buddies, okay, and and I've got, and I use buddies as the guys who are kind of my little Iowa, um, some who know Jesus and some who don't know Jesus yet, okay? But there's a common theme that, that, that I see. And, and the common theme is this. Drift happens. And when drift happens, my friends start to hide from friendship and they start to slide into places they, they normally wouldn't. Hear it again. And think of your own life, right? When drift happens and, 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 and the anchor's not set, right? Whether it's, the, whether it's the daily anchor of Bible reading and prayer, whether it's a Sunday anchor of worship together, right? Or whether it's even the add-on of friendships. When, when that anchor isn't set, drift happens. And when drift happens... My pattern and the pattern of my friends is you start to hide from the people who love you 
and you start to slide into spots that you that you normally that you normally wouldn't you wouldn't go there and and stay stay in in, in mark 14 and and just just go a little farther and and just catch this now and 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 this is this is that that moment right same verse, same chapter. Jesus just was vulnerable in front of his people, in front of his friends. And, and here's hiding and sliding. Here, here's the end result of hiding and sliding, okay? Just as he was speaking in Mark 14, Judas, one of the 12, appeared. <laughs> with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now, the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. And just, just consider this, right? The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him on the cheek as was custom. And the men seized Jesus and they arrested him. But here's what I want you to know. Judas ending up in this spot, the drift didn't start the day before. The drift started a long time time ago. In fact, we have, we have very little about Judas. We have, we have very little. But I want to take it to a spot that gives us some insight into this idea of hiding and sliding. You're in Mark now. Go to the right in your Bible to the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And go to John chapter 12. Okay? John chapter 12. Now, in, in, in John 12, we, we, we just have the moment, right? And, and this is fascinating. So it starts with this, and it says, So six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, with whom Jesus raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table, right? And then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples... Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a day's wages. And Jesus shuts him down. Jesus shuts him down. But the hiding and the sliding that ended up in Judas drifting away from Jesus to the point of even betrayal started a long time. And my friends, here's my... Here's my, here's my my prayer, and here's what I want for you. Here's what I, I want for you. I want you, I want you to, to, to set that Sunday anchor down of, with God's family. And when you set that anchor down and you, one day a week, one time, you stop and you go, okay, okay, there he is, I'm giving you room, and, and right, and you do it. And you add to that, you add, you add to that these, these friendships that are, that are around Jesus. They move you from attending to connecting. From a place that I attend to a family I'm connected to. Friends when, that you sit around with and they know when you're not there and they help with each other's burdens and passions and even the kids. Don't stay isolated and anonymous anymore in this thing called the church. Don't do it. <laughs> we were talking about this this week with our, all of our campus pastors on a Zoom. And I'm telling you that if you'll set the anchor and you'll add to it deep friendships, you'll, you'll seek them, God will do some amazing things in you. At our, at our indie campus, Pastor Matt, he sent me this note, and the note says this. We have this group of guys TLC guys, from their 20s through their 60s, old men like me, who gather one time enough to connect and read Scripture. And they've been doing this, and they've developed friendship to this point, and we've started to regularly pray for each other. New jobs, crisis in families. And just this last Monday, we even circled around a guy and prayed for something he's going through. And all this happens in a brewery with friends. Pastor Nathan at Fort Dodge, he's, when we were talking about this, he said, oh, we have a gal, and her name is Anna. And Anna sent this story, and I'm going to read part of it to you. Anna says, when my ex-husband and I first separated, 
but trying to fix things. He had brought up going to Prairie Lakes as a family because I had brought it up in previous years. The first day walking into Prairie Lakes, I was filled with so much, listen to this, I was filled with so much fear, shame, and guilt from the most recent events that had taken place in my life and my marriage. I was lost and questioning every bit of my being. We were welcomed with smiles, and there was a sense of peace. But due to my job, I wasn't able to attend on a regular basis with the family. In other words, the anchor wasn't set. Things took a turn through the divorce with my ex-husband. I got a job with a better schedule, allowed me time with my boys as a single mom, but also allowed me to start attend church on a regular basis. I was that person, sat in the back, alone, just there. As time went on, I started to allow God to do His work. Did you hear that? As time went on, I started to allow God to do His work. You would catch me not sitting in the same seat at church, but still towards the back, hoping no one would see me while I was bawling my eyes out or recognize me as the gal that always was crying by herself. I was starting to heal from the inside out. The first Christmas without my boys, I attended the evening service and we sang this little light of mine. My light had been burnt out for so long I couldn't bear singing that song. I ran to the bathroom crying. A gal came in and asked to pray for me. <laughs> a year had gone by and, and I stepped over the, the faith line but wasn't sure what to do next. And while my life was falling apart and I had no support, I, I found myself to ask, I found it in myself to ask Pastor Kyle if I could meet with him to ask questions and, and, and explain my situation and figure out what was next. And a few weeks passed and I couldn't find it in me to move from my seat after a service to get my boys because I was an absolute mess after the sermon. I had finally read the no matter statement and felt it deep within my heart and soul. A complete stranger put a hand on my shoulder and asked if she could sit with me and pray for me. That stranger's name is Katie and months later invited me out to dinner and wanted to get, get to know me. And as our connection grew and I allowed God and our friendship, and, and I allowed God, our friendship blossomed. Things started to change. I started to see how happy my boys were going to church. I started to sense peace, comfort, and joy again. Gina with Family Ministries reached out to ask us anything the church could help with as she noticed it was just me and the boys attending. She was so kind and sweet, always greeting with us when she would see us. Walking down to take the boys to their rooms, I started noticing others calling the boys by their names and smiling while we walked by. October this last year, after talking with Katie, I knew it was time, time to be baptized, to show everybody that my sins are washed away, my past and my burdens, Jesus has taken. A few weeks later, the boys were dedicated. It was all happening so fast, a little overwhelming, but God always knows what he's doing and he knows how the story goes. If you'll add friendships around Jesus to this anchor of Sunday connecting with God's family, that could be you. That could be you. The beginning of this year, Jesse's first message, the first series we did in Ephesians, he said, let's have a goal this year. And here's what he said, let's find a friend and grow together. Find your people. Get in the group. Join a Bible study. Get on a serving team. Go on a mission ship. Pray, and God will deliver friendships around Jesus. Set the Sunday anchor of church together and deepen it with friendships around Jesus. Let me pray right now. Father, we don't want to drift. We don't want to end up in a spot we didn't think we'd ever be. We don't want to all of a sudden wake up and go, what happened? So Father, I pray that in each one of our hearts, each one of our souls, each one of our spirits, and each one of our minds, God, we would set that anchor today. Set that anchor, that Sunday anchor, and give you room. And I pray, God, that that Sunday anchor, you'd add to it with deep, friendships in this place around Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Thanks for that message, Pastor John. And I know for my wife, Sarah, and I personally, when church stopped becoming just something that we attended to being a place that we really felt like we belonged, that was almost like a second home for us, was when we started to have friendships and community that were just really centered around Jesus. And for us, um, a lot of those relationships happen in a small group, um, but also just like having those people that we see every Sunday that we can connect with. Our kids can kind of wrestle each other or chase each other in the lobby. Um, and, and that has just been truly life-giving for us to have that rhythm. So whatever that looks like for you, maybe you've been attending online and you just um, need to take that step to attend in person um, at one of our physical campuses. So you can attend regularly, you can meet people, you can develop friendships, you can attend with them on Sunday. Um, or, or maybe it's just being more consistent. Maybe you're a once a month or every other week and, uh, and you just need to be anchored in a more routine rhythm of showing up every Sunday, even through a summer time when it's just easier to disengage. Just encourage you to create a plan, follow the plan, work the plan. Um, and I just know that God will use that in significant ways. So, so be sure to just prioritize that, have that conversation with your significant other, your spouse here, even yet today. But as always, if you need prayer or someone to talk to, I'm on the other end. Um, I'd love to spend some time connecting with you, seeing how I can pray for you. Um, and all you need to do is hit the live prayer button. And I'm on the other end, um, and I would love to connect with you there. Kids, you are up next. Children's ministry is going to start in just one minute. Everyone else will see you back next week.
Hey. Hey. Welcome to Story Lab. This week we're talking about joy. And about how some of the most epic parties ever have been thrown by God. Let's go. Hey, I'm Carter. Oh, uh, and I'm Zeke. Today, we're talking about joy, which is choosing to celebrate what God is doing. You know, instead of being glued to your phone screen. Hey, I happen to be reading about something God made. What's that? Laughter. <laughs> what about it? Laughter's the best medicine. Not antibiotics? No, seriously. Laughter helps you breathe in more oxygen and increases the endorphins released by your brain. Endorphins, right. The chemicals that make you feel happy. See, laughter is like taking a vitamin for the soul. Yeah, but you can choose to take a vitamin. Laughing just, you know, it happens. Well, this says when you make yourself laugh, a real laugh will happen. Okay. This isn't working. I don't feel healthy, I just feel kind of silly. Maybe we need to laugh harder. Ah, that's it. This is a bust. Oh, I know a knock knock joke. Okay. Say knock knock. Knock knock. Who's there? I don't know. Huh? Huh? Ah, you got. Oh, you were supposed to laugh. It, it's funny. We are totally unfunny today. <sighs> I never thought it'd be this hard to find some LOLs. Wait a minute. Are you saying that finding some laughs is a challenge? Oh, you are on. Let's do it. Welcome to the LOL Challenge! Great. Okay, how do we do this? You have one minute to take turns making each other laugh. Most LOLs achieved wins! Go! What? Okay, right now? Uh, uh. <laughs> ah. Now say it! <laughs> what? Chubby checker. Ch chubby checker, say it. I feel healthier already. Yeah, gotta make a habit of laughing more. Speaking of habits, it's time for the story before the story. Today we're starting out in Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created a beautiful, incredible world. But people turned away from God and the world was broken. Even then, God had a plan to restore us to relationship. God chose a man named Abraham and promised to bless the whole world through his family. That family, the Israelites, grew in number. They were enslaved in Egypt, but God had led them to freedom. In the wilderness, God gave them laws to keep them safe and connected to God. Before God's people finally entered the land God had promised, their leader, Moses, reminded them of everything God had spoken. Which is where our story starts. Take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Brian. And I need you to hold on to your seats because we are going to cover a lot of ground today. After 40 long years in the wilderness, the Israelites were about to enter the land God had promised to them. Moses spoke to the people. Remember that God told us, I have given you all this land. Now Moses knew how easy it is to forget. He knew that in the new land, God's people would be surrounded by nations who didn't necessarily follow God's ways. 
So Moses took time to remind the Israelites of the main things God had said and done over the last 40 years. In fact, this speech of his is most of the book of Deuteronomy. Listen to the rules and laws I'm going to teach you. Obey them and you will live. <laughs> yeah, sounds pretty serious, huh? And it was. Except that God never meant for us to be serious all the time. In fact, God actually told the Israelites to plan big parties throughout the year. Seriously, these celebrations were to be reminders of all that God had done for them, including a special festival at harvest time each year. Gather the grain from your threshing floors, take the fresh wine from your wine presses, then celebrate the Feast of Booths for seven days. Be filled with joy and honor the Lord your God. The Lord will bless you in everything you do, and you will be full of joy. I've got a question for you. What's the longest party that you've ever been to? Maybe you've had a birthday party that was like an all-day adventure. But God told the people to celebrate for seven whole days, an entire week. See, it's easy to get busy and forget about the amazing things God has done. So God told the Israelites to get in the habit of pausing, to look around and see God's goodness and to share it with each other. God knew that it would bring them life-giving joy. As we travel through God's story recorded in the Bible, we discovered that the Israelites didn't always keep these feasts, but every time they did, it helped them remember all that God had done. In the time of Solomon, the third king of Israel, the entire nation gathered together to celebrate the Feast of Booths by taking the Ark of the Covenant into the newly built temple. Lord, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You keep the covenant you made with us. You show us your love. You do that when we follow you with all our hearts. Now in this case, the people celebrated for two whole weeks. Because they remembered all that God had done for them, their hearts were full of joy. After Solomon though, the kingdom split in two. Israel and Judah were led by many kings. Now, a few of these kings were wise and listened to God, but most of them just forgot about God. And eventually the kingdoms were attacked. The people were scattered or captured and taken to foreign lands. But at long last, a group of people were allowed to return to their homeland. After the wall of Jerusalem was rebuilt, the people gathered together to hear the priest Ezra read aloud from God's laws for the first time in many years. Praise the Lord. He is the great God. Amen. 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 The people quickly realized that they had been ignoring God's laws. They were so moved that they began to weep. But Ezra told them, This day is set apart to honor the Lord your God. So don't weep. Don't be sad. And the governor, Nehemiah, encouraged them. Go and enjoy some good food and sweet drinks. Send some of it to people who don't have any. This day is holy to our Lord. So don't be sad. The joy of the Lord makes you strong. How awesome is that? God's joy can make us strong and be able to face even the most difficult things in life. The Israelites went on to celebrate in a special way. We are to live in special shelters during the Feast of Booths. Go out into the central hill country. Bring back some branches and use them to make booths. For a whole week, the people camped out in these shelters, as they had in the wilderness, and shared joyful meals together. God's people continue to celebrate this feast. In fact, hundreds of years later, when Jesus arrived on the scene, they were still celebrating every single year. On the last day of the festival, Jesus entered the courtyard of the temple to teach. And just as he did so often, Jesus chose to take something old and make it new. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Does anyone believe in me? Then, just as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from inside them. He must be a prophet. Maybe he's the one God has sent to rescue us. The Feast of Booths had always been a joyful time for the Israelites to remember how God provided for their needs. But Jesus took it one step further. Just as God had provided food and water in the wilderness, now God had sent Jesus to offer living water, a way to life forever with God. It was the most joyful news the Israelites had ever received. And it's still the most joyful news that we can celebrate today. The end. Mm, God wants us to party. How about that?
It's easy to think of God's laws as really hard. Or not very exciting. But God actually wants us to spend time celebrating. Exactly. God loves us deeply and made a way for our lives to be filled with joy no matter what we face. So, what's our part in the story? Well, if we're gonna be honest, a lot of days don't feel very joyful. I mean, there's getting up early and school and chores and arguments with your brother or sister. That's why God actually wants us to get in the habit of pausing to look for joy. By celebrating. And remembering all the good things God has done for us. Yep. You don't even need to build yourself a shelter out of branches and celebrate for a week. To be honest, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it does. But you can also look for places in your everyday life to celebrate and find joy. Like at dinner time or bedtime. Exactly. I mean, some families take turns sharing one thing that brought them joy during the day. Yeah, like a friend who said something really encouraging when you were sad. Or something crazy your puppy did. Your family could even create some bigger habits each year. If you always go camping for your dad's birthday, use that time to focus on the good things God has given your family. Or if you get to take a special trip to grandma's every summer, take the time in the car to talk about some of your favorite memories. Instead of one more, are we there yet? Well said. I love that God gives us the power to make good habits, like choosing joy. And that joy actually makes us stronger. That is something to celebrate, for sure. Woohoo! See you next time. So here's the thing, make a habit of choosing joy. Just like you can choose to laugh more. Even when you aren't feeling it. You know what I'm feeling, Carter? Hmm. This is worse than the Yankees. <laughs> what? This is worse than the dentist. I had no idea what you just said. <laughs> Thanks for joining us in the story. <sighs> Thanks for joining us in the story lab. See you next time. You should be like, hey, what do I get here? What are you doing, Lager? Iron Man? Yeah, you want to go uh, get some dates or something? I don't know how to face it. I think you can do that. Oh, get ready to see.